Will do. Welcome to the Keeping the Nostalgia Live Show. I'm your host, Billy Powell. As you can see with us is former Boilermaker, Boilermaker, Boilermaker for life, it seems, uh, Todd Foster. Todd, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. I know your time is precious, but uh, uh, with this time of crisis and stuff like that, I guess you got a little bit of time to uh, help us keep the nostalgia alive about the game of basketball. Oh, well, thank you for having me on here. This is going to be a, you know, a situation for what I can – think back my years with all these new guys coming into Purdue and they were born in 01 and 02 and and I keep thinking man I graduated 96 so you know for my memory to think back that far I've been uh, kicked in the head a little bit too much I think so hopefully I can recall some you know stories or some memories for you. Okay before I get started though I don't want to offend you so you see that little guy in the back that's standing there? Oh yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna take this. We'll do that for the show. What do you think about that? Hey, that's all right. Coach K is like a father to me. Um, but I'm gonna tell you what, you know, Coach Knight is a legend in my eyes. There's no question. You need more coaches like him, I believe. He's old school, he teaches the game. And, and he's just, you know, he's like a, a father figure to those kids. And I think some coaches nowadays just want to get along with them at some point. But I'm, I'm a big fan of Coach Knight. You know, we would not have that rivalry if it wasn't for Coach Katie and Coach Knight. And that's what makes the game and the state of Indiana so much fun to watch. You know, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but something interesting. You know, everybody has the perception that Indiana hates Purdue. Is that the same – is that the reality when it comes to basketball, the game of basketball, or you guys just have respect for each other? I know you – I know Indiana wants to beat Purdue. Purdue wants to beat Indiana. But it, it, that rivalry is very, very tense. But it, explain that a little bit or how you feel about it or how, what you went through with it. Well, my, my personal feelings, you know, when you get in that game for the first time or when you're playing against Indiana – you know, you have respect for the players at all times. But when, when it's 40 minutes, you can throw that out the door and you just go at each other because you're wanting to win. What, what's fun about it is the people in the stands, they're the ones that get all crazy about it. And as a, as a Purdue player, I wanted to win for my fans. I want to win for my coach and my teammates. Um, I'm 100% for all of them, and I'm going after them no matter what I have to do. I'm going to play my tail off of them because they made it possible for me to be wearing that Purdue jersey. So, for me, when you hit that hardwood, it's five on five. 15,000 fans isn't going to help you. you got to play the game. That's why I love playing on the road more at home because you had everybody against you. you got your back against the wall. I love that atmosphere. So, as far as the players, hey, I had a lot of respect for them. There is no question. I mean, we're going to, you know, after the game, I'll talk to them. And I've seen a couple of players um, throughout the years, and it's great to visit with them. Um, it, it, and that's what made me, you know, respect them more because they're, they're class kids, and I loved them. And it, but when it's 40 minutes, it's, you know, our team against their team. Fans can't do anything about it, and you can see all these fans getting upset with each other. But I just wanted to win for our coach and our school. Todd, tell everybody a little about, uh, about where you're from, uh, uh, your parents, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, did they, uh, all those incorporated, did they have athletic skills and stuff that passed along to you? And just tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I grew up outside of Washington, Illinois. It's just right outside of Peoria. Um, is one player you remember probably from Purdue, Doug Lee, that graduated in 87. He's my brother-in-law. He grew up in town there and married my sister but we lived on I went to a grade school I had 68 kids in it and I had basically I had nine kids in my class which was kind of large and uh, we had 68 kids K through eight and it was just a little farm school all the you know classes grades one and two were in the same you know had the same teacher in the same room grades three and four one teacher so we didn't have that much uh room in that building and the gym was so small the ceiling was a foot above the backboard and that's where we kind of developed basketball we played all the time growing up in there and I was the youngest 
my sister was the oldest. She was eight years older than I was, and my brother was three years older than I was. And so I was always the one getting picked on. But when we were little, we always went to uh, horse shows and rodeos. My sister was in rodeo a lot, and so we were always, you know, competing, contesting in, with the horse shows. And so we were always outside, bailing hay, doing all the farm work, doing whatever we had to. And you just learn life a little bit harder than it is, I think, when you're, you know, you're going up and you have chores. We didn't have, we had three TV stations. We didn't have internet. We didn't have any of that stuff. So you kept busy being outside doing working. If not, you're shooting baskets in the barn. And that was me was, you know, I wanted, I used to go in town to, on Friday nights and watch the high school game. And I wanted to be like them. They were my idols. And one of them was Doug Lee, which was my brother-in-law. Got to watch him play against Doug Altenberger at Richwoods that went to Illinois. Uh, Tony Weisinger. Um, you know, you can, I can sit there and name some players from Fiore that's played at Illinois, Indiana, and Purdue. And it's been, it's been a blessing for me in those years. And I lost my mom when I was um, 15 years old. And she died of cancer. She went in the hospital, and uh, a month later she passed away. So it was kind of a, a surprise. She never got to see me play in high school. But in my mind, I just wanted, you know, wanted to be successful for her and help my dad. My dad was kind of um, took it hard. And he just always said, if it wasn't for us kids, you know, he, he wouldn't want to be here. So I felt like I had, you know, I was obligated to, you know, do my part for the family and, and take care of this opportunity. Uh, my sister uh, married Doug and she didn't play any sports. She just, like I said, rodeoed and my brother. Um, wound up playing. He graduated from Southern Illinois and played baseball. His fresh, freshman year, he went to ICC. Um, he went to junior college outside of East Peoria there and played with Jim Tomey for, uh, for years. And we got to know Jim because my brother guarded him in high school. I had to guard Jim in high school because he was right between our age. Great kid, um, great player back then. Um, still, he's, you know, he's one of my idols in baseball. But my brother was very successful football player in high school, basketball and baseball. And I wanted to kind of follow his footsteps. So he helped me a lot growing up in, in kind of keeping the faith and believing in yourself. And that was the hardest thing. We didn't have AAU then. I remember my sophomore year, um, we'd work, we'd walk beans in the morning and we'd go in and play open gym. And then we'd come in the afternoon, we either bell hay or did some kind of work. And so basically, you know, we didn't have no time to go to these tournaments. We didn't hear anything, but, you know, we had somebody come in the gym and wanted me to play in Iowa for an AAU team. We, I've never heard of that. My high school coach never heard of that. And it kind of turned around and, um, you know, I decided, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go with my team to a team camp and, you know, play in the gym every day. And I was very fortunate with my high school coach, Steve Doty, who, you know, he, to me, is a legend because he played at – Bradley University and he taught man to man and believe it or not he was a Bobby Knight fan he had Bobby Knight stuff in his office and he he went hard in practice and got honest and I always felt like he was the hardest on me but then I come to realize that there was a reason you know he was trying to get to my potential and I respected it you know so I was very fortunate to have a guy like you know Coach Doty, and now his son is coaching in Illinois, and it's it's just great to see his tradition keep living. What is the difference between basketball in Illinois and the high school level and basketball in Indiana? Similar? Very similar. I mean, the states, you know, you know, you got your own state up north, Chicago. That I mean, that alone, you, you're producing talent. Um, we get some, we played against some Chicago schools at the Peak and Holiday Tournament. Um, so it was always fun to play against somebody, you know, from that region. But as far as the competition, um, you know, Indiana has tradition. You know, and when I came to Purdue on my visit, I just remember hearing the stories and talking with the, the teammates out there. And it just, it just uh, and I think the movie Hoosiers really developed that. And just hearing stories, how it was just back then, it was one class. And that was, to me, that was um, kind of provides the history of Indiana. So that is alone is that that takes a, quite a bit of um, respect, you know, when you're looking at all these schools. And it was when I actually came to Purdue, I went to some high school games. 
and they were fun to watch. I mean, they had crowds, and especially was when it was in the playoffs. And it's different in Illinois. We always start off in regionals, then go to sectionals. And here it's opposite. So when people say, hey, yeah, we won regionals, I said, well, that's that's good. What, you win one or two games and you won it? But no, it's always opposite. I had to get used to that right away. But I even went to uh, the Wabash, um, who was a Wabash and DePaul college game when I was in college, when I was playing. And that was, that was unbelievable. That was to me, that was tradition. I looked like the Indiana tradition right there. The gym was packed. Um, and, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if you're in Mackey Arena or where I was down in Crawfordville watching. It was fun to watch. It was a great contest. Uh, besides Purdue, and I'm going to get back to your high school career uh, in just a minute, what other jersey would we have possibly seen you wear if you would not have made the commitment and decided to play for uh, Purdue University? Well, I did probably Southern Illinois, the Salukis, because my brother was playing down there. I went on a visit for football. I went on a uh, visit for football down there. And we had a 40 acre farm on the very tip of Southern Illinois where we always went goose hunting every, you know, every winter. That was our family vacation pretty much, just going down and goose hunting. And, and I thought, man, I was looking at, you know, the, with Mark Twain Force and you're looking around and you're sitting there thinking, man, I could be playing ball and going out and hunting all the time. You know, and that was kind of important to me because I, I went hunting every day if I could. I'd wake up, you know, the days before games and go hunting. Um, and in the morning of the game, I'd go out, not for very long, but it was, that was kind of tradition for me. I just like being in the woods and hunting and, and that was important. So I really thought about Southern Illinois. I wanted to play football, but I also wanted to play basketball. And at that time, Purdue didn't offer. They were watching me, but they didn't offer. So it was kind of a, a situation where, you know, would I want to be on a team of about 70, 80 players, or do I want to be on a team of about 15? And I, I'm a more, I'm a family guy. I really love having a small group of guys as you have each other's back. And I just felt when I went to, I went to Western Illinois. You know, I mean, when you're w with some of these players, um, it was hard. Because, you know, they're, they come from all different backgrounds when you got 70, 80 players and you're, you want to gel with everybody. Because I, I, I care about my teammates more than myself. And I just felt like the opportunity for basketball could have been there, you know, if, if um, at Southern Illinois, if I would have wanted to play both. They asked me about that. And I was really thinking about that. And it would have been hard because, you know, you had to gain weight. You had to lift all the time. You know, I'm not the tallest guy. I'm six foot. And that's one thing when I went to Illinois for football on a visit, they just said, hey, right now we have a couple guys in front of you, but you need to gain a lot more weight. So if they don't take these scholarships, we're going to be knocking at your door. And so I felt like, well, it's during basketball season. I can't gain that weight. I, I can't be 220 pounds right now. So I just turned around and just tried to stay on focus on basketball. But that's the same year, my senior year in high school, when Purdue had a couple transfer, I think Richie Mount transferred, um, Shuttle Cotty transferred. They lost a couple players. I think Woody Austin became ineligible. Um, and so a scholarship opened up. So I was just blessed and had the opportunity when they called and said, hey, we want to bring you on a visit. And because I went to their camps when I was uh, in freshman and sophomore high school. And, and I went to the D1 camps uh, for Hoover. And uh, that was fun. And, and just so they got to see me play a little bit. And I think Coach Katie or Coach Weber came. One of them came and saw me. I think it was Coach Katie when I hit the state record in threes in a game, 11 for 14. And um, so that helped. So somebody was looking over me and on that game. But it just opened the door when they offered. I talked to my brother-in-law that played for Coach Katie. And he just says, Todd, he's the one guy I would definitely recommend to play for you. I mean, he's he's like a father. And that in he was, he was right on it. And so it was kind of hard to sit there to try to judge between what sport. But I just went with my gut feeling, and, and um, I knew it would be difficult. And I knew, you know, going into uh, Purdue my first year, you know, the other guys in my recruiting class was a guy named Glenn Robinson, <laughs> Conville Martin, Brandon Brantley, Herb Dove. Uh, and then we had Kenny Williams, a Juco All-American from Kankakee. And now all of a sudden, you know, instead of, you know, playing against guys six, seven, six, eight, you know, a little slower, now you're playing against Glenn Robinson, six, nine, the best college player I've still seen today in person. 
by far with all that talent. I couldn't believe he was a freshman coming in there. I was just shocked. And and Doug always says, if you have a big man or a power forward like that that can do some work like that, you guys will be successful. He said, you better be on that team with them. So it was. It was very intimidating at first. The confidence level I had, I just didn't feel like, man, should I be here? Should I not be here? You know, but then when you start playing pickup games, the competitiveness got me. And then it's like, you know what? You can miss every shot, but you can still play hard. You can still play defense. And that was what Coach Katie preached. And I'm like, well, I can do that. You, I can dive on the floor. I'll take charge. They can hit me all they want. That was the football in me. So, I mean, I played football and I loved the contact. Couldn't wait for contact. So, when we did charge drills, so that was a favorite drill. You know, the bull in the ring where you line everybody on a three-point line, you got to take ten charges or whatever it is. I loved it. And they were diving on the floor drills. Those are fun because then you really find out who really wants to go at it. So it was kind of, a, you know, a prediction at first where I was, like, kind of hesitant on it. But then, you know, it really worked out for the best, you know, being at Purdue because I could play for that guy. Now, we go to UNLV, no. I don't fit in that style. You know, I, I want, I'd rather make a good pass and get somebody else the ball, come down. I couldn't wait to play defense. Defense was the best part of the game. Offense, hey, that's fine. That's when I try to rest at times. And But defense is when you give 110% and you just go at the other team. You know, I live in Houston, Texas, but, and I've lived here for the past 22, 23 years. And, of course, you know, the Houston Rodeo is here. It's, it's, it's huge. Oh, yeah, the big one. It's, big money. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, it's huge. Tell us a little bit about uh, the rodeo, getting into it. Where did your love come from? Uh, and what did you do? And also, you know, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but I know there's a story that, you know, you came to a practice or something like that, and you had a big uh, bump on your head. I think this was during uh, – while you were at St. Joe's and you were getting ready to get a job at Purdue as the assistant, as assistant coach. But Coach Gene Cady said, no, nah, we, we can't have you doing that anymore. <laughs> Well, where I like I said, where we grew up, you know, we didn't have neighbors, and so we were outside. You know, we had some horses, and basically, my sister to practice roping, and my brother and their friends. I was the, you know, either the, if the calf wasn't in there, I, a lot of times they would just practice on me. So I'd be in the chute, and I had to run out, and they would rope me. And um, if you ever been roped, it's not, it's not, not fun. You get those marks across your face when that rope hits you, and uh, yeah, but that was the only way that I got to be able to play with them. You know, they said, okay, you're the calf. Let's go. We're going to rope you or they team rope me or whatever. And it was, you know, it was a little difficult at times, but I got to play with them. And it, I think it made me a little tougher in that sense. Um, but we were always, when I was grade school, we were going to horse shows every weekend, sleeping in the trailers. Um, and that was fun. I mean, we were competing, doing contests. And then my sister, when she got in high school, she started doing a high school rodeo and going to the rodeos and watching her. And I always wanted to be a rodeo clown. I wanted to do that. But that opportunity I had to keep away from in high school just because I was competing in, you know, football and basketball. And I wanted to stay, you know, not, I didn't want to be injured, say that. I had to be careful about it. But when Purdue came, um, it was an opportunity where – um, met a guy named Toby Turner, who was a wrestler, who was very well known in Indiana for uh, wrestling and rodeo. And he did all the events and so got to became good friends with him. And I started entering some rodeos and um, started doing the saddle bronc and, and um, bull riding. And I used a different name. I used one of our manager's name, then basically Buddy Baker, who's an agent now. But um, he was, uh, I used his name when I went and rode in these rodeos. And uh, it was fun. I mean, I learned a lot. And it was just a way to get away from basketball. Is it, you know, it just get away from the court sometimes. You need that little break, even if it's for a couple hours to go to a rodeo. And I just went to, you know, just a handful during the summer. And there was many times, you know, you, you know we went and practice. You get banged up quite a bit. And, you know, you just don't want to show it. You just come in, you play, even though you got bruises on you or you got little marks on you. You just say, oh, we just, you know, messing with my roommates. But it, it, it worked out great. It was fun because then my – when I graduated from Purdue, I went to CBA for about a month there. I was at Rockford. And then when Tate George got released from the Nets and he came in, 
Um, I made the squad. Then also when Tate George got released, he came in and knocked me out. And they said, well, do you want to go to the – I believe at that time it was that IBL or something, some different league out in the Dakotas, and Porter was playing in it. And I said, man, I needed – I had to get reconstruction surgery on my ankle and I had to get some things done and I, I knew I wanted to coach. So I thought this is the time to do some rodeos. I was living in my truck. Basically I had about five jobs. I was working a little bit everywhere, sleeping in my truck at rest stops, at Mackey arena. Um, I had a little topper on the back of my truck. And so I just jumped in the back of there and always slept and kept my food in the cooler. And it was, it was fun. It was fine. I mean, I didn't, take much for me to be happy um you know and and then I was able to go and rodeo pretty hard and, and then all of a sudden opportunity to go to southern Idaho and coach with Jim Thrash for a little bit then I came back and coached uh, with Bill Bland at St. Joseph College and got with Coach Hoover again and I was also going around speaking to kids trying to teach them the best way to to you know prepare yourself for life how to work hard you know have family first um and, it, and that was just a blessing because when I go out and speak, I kept on thinking about what I want to do in my future. And at that time, yeah, I knew I wanted a college coach. I knew it was hard. Um, but I was very fortunate to have people like Jerry Hoover and Bill Bland that gave me the first opportunity at St. Joseph College. Then I got kind of recruited by Scott Drew and Homer Drew up at Valpo to come up and coach with them. Well, their monthly contract, I mean, they were on, I believe I got paid for 10 months. And I believe it was, I got paid $10,000 to coach at St. Uh, I mean, at Valparaiso. I took it. I said, this is a great opportunity, Division I. Um, and Coach Drews, the both of them, Scott and Homer, were awesome people. The whole staff were. And I kind of fell in love with them because they were just good people. And I knew I wanted to do that. And so by the time I went to Valpo, I knew I had to make some money during the summer. So I was speaking camps. But then I got um, pretty much um, – Doc Davis, who owned Winchester Rodeo Company, wanted me to come and be his rodeo clown. <laughs> so I started fighting bulls. And, uh, and at that time, there was a lot of county fairs and, and was going to rodeos on the weekends for two or three, you know, Friday through Sunday, fighting bulls, getting knocked, getting whatever. And, and then when Coach Katie called me and says, hey, we have a position down here. Would you be interested? And he was, I believe, out of the country then um, for the uh, – Olympic team and I, I said sure I will that'd be awesome well when right before he got back I believe on that Monday that Saturday I was at a rodeo in Greencastle and the guy got hung up so that's my job to get him off of there so I remember trying to get him and I knew the only way is just go up and grab him by the head and just try to hang on and when I did they full kicked me in the head and I got knocked out and um, they tried to get me an ambulance I said man that's gonna be a lot of money I'm fine just let me catch my breath and Finished the rodeo. I said, I'll go to the hospital when I'm done. Somebody will drive me. I'm good just to get checked. But I did come in Monday, and I had a pretty good mark. Couldn't see out of the one eye hardly. It was marked up pretty good. And uh, I just – coach just said, you're done with that, you know. But I said, well, I only have like two more rodeos. I, I, I don't want to turn the guy down. I just let me finish these rodeos. I promise I'll be all right. And so I did. I finished the, that summer out fighting bulls for him and um, then I started getting into steer wrestling I got rid of the rough stock and I just started doing the steer wrestling which is the bulldog and jumping off grabbing horns you know twisting them so I did that for a long time for about I would say all together about 12 13 years competitive I was going to about oh anywhere from 20 to 30 rodeos in between and then when I got out of coaching I was going about 40 rodeos so it was, it was a blessing. It's fun. I love that contact. You get your frustration when you go and practice in a pen. And just, it just gets you wired up like you're getting ready to play a game. But Todd, that was kind of the rodeo part. Yeah. Is this something, too, that you're yeah, – I know you have three little ones. Do they know about it? Do you uh, – are they uh, – uh, you know, of course, they have chores. Are, are they – have they been introduced to uh, cows and horses and all that kind of stuff? you think this is going to continue on? Because, you know, sometimes you think – you know, this may dwindle or die. I mean, is this something that you think will keep on going? No, I mean, I, I blew both of my knees out. Um, I was in a rodeo in Wisconsin, and, and this is when my new position now, when I was out of coaching, I blew my left knee pretty bad. 
and finished the year. And then now and then I blew the next year at the finals. Um, in the regional finals, I blew my right knee out. And then I had to, you know, I came back and did the next night and finished the season. And I actually won it with that blue knee. And it, it to me, I sat there and said, you know, I, I'm having troubles with my knees right now. And my kids are just starting to get to doing sports. My oldest one now is 14. And at that time, I mean, she was start. She went to a couple of rodeos with me, and I thought it's time for me to stay at home and and stick it out with them and be there for them instead of being on the road during the weekends and hit these rodeos. And I wanted to be there for my wife and my kids, and so I kind of gave that up. But I still, we still had the horses. Um, I had about 20 head of cattle. I just sold them last winter. Um, just in the fact, it was just we had too much going on with the kids there and every activity already. They love riding. I mean, old Bam Bam, my son, who's 10, he got bucked off, and we were laughing so hard, and he cracked his helmet. He went flying off like Superman, and I didn't think about him getting hurt. He just stood right up, and I was like, way to get up. That's awesome. Then I started seeing, oh, he could have broke his neck then. So then it kind of made me think a little bit that, hey, we need to settle down on this. So we just kind of just ride along. They want to they wanna mess with it a little bit, but they're so – active in all their other sports that it's kind of hard we just keep the horses and we got chickens and but I just sold the cattle and just kind of said you know what we have a, a barn here that's got a gym in it so we keep busy in here quite a bit. Uh, tell us about that first day you get to Purdue on campus were you were you shocked were you uh, I mean what tell us about that initial uh, reception at Purdue once you got there as a freshman. My freshman year, I remember I went over that summer, and that's when I first saw Glenn. I was like, man, this guy is no way. This guy is unbelievable. And then Conzo and then all the other players. And, and Coach Matt Painter was my host when I was on my recruiting visit. And he, I mean, he'll tell you the truth. Um, he was great to, uh, as a host. And then we got there as a senior. I mean, he wasn't a senior. He was going to be a junior. But he acted like a senior. And you could see that he was going to be a successful coach someday because he was always coaching out there trying to organize the guys. And I like that atmosphere. I love those guys sticking together. They are always together. Um, and it was kind of intimidating because now, I mean, the, the size level, you had to change your game before I could, you know, bully my way in there and, you know, shoot a little jumper or shoot a little layup over, you know, another 6'5 guy. I could do that. Now you go in there, you're going to get that thing rejected. So I just learned to play the game, keep your spacing, go set screens, keep the ball moving, play defense on the other end. So that was enjoyable to learn that. But it's also, like I said, it was intimidating. And But then when you're on that campus, you know, 35,000 kids, I mean, to me, I'm like, I never had neighbors growing up. And now I'm sitting in a dorm. I mean, there were squirrels sitting right out there, and I thought, man, I could just pop one of those things right now. And it was just difficult, just just looking around and just getting adjusted to that. And because it, my homesick was not be able to go hunting as much. I did find some spots around here. I was very fortunate. Some great alumni allowed me to go and hunt on their land. But it, it that was the hardest part. I mean, I, and this is where we're at nowadays. I had a shotgun in my dorm. <laughs> I kept my gun in my dorm. I didn't think nothing of it. I had it in the case. It was locked up. It was underneath my bed, and that's where I kept it. And nowadays, oh, wow, yeah, it's a little bit different. But so every time that I had my bow, went, went bow hunting, and, you know, every morning we woke up from the hotel for home games, I, I still went deer hunting. Even when I was a senior, I went hunting in the morning of games. And it was uh, – that was just part of my life growing up. I loved the outdoors, the country living, and – being at Purdue with 35 students, that was, uh, it was kind of uncomfortable for me. I don't like, I don't, never did like attention. So that's why in college I started going out and speaking. And I, I learned, my brother-in-law told me, he said, you need to get out there and speak to kids. I love working with kids. And that to me is a blessing. That's our future. And trying to have them have dreams and goals. And it doesn't have to be just in sports. It could be everything. So it was gaining that confidence was my biggest, you know, weakness at first because I did just, you know, it was not being around everybody. I used to walk under my high school years. I walked underneath the bleachers, you know, because I didn't want to be in the limelight. I didn't want people looking at me. And 
that was something when I got to college, I had to learn and had to adjust with and being around great teammates, you know, gaining that confidence was helpful. But again, like when you pull up for a game, my freshman year, I remember the first game, um, Ian Stanback, who's probably one of my best friends for me, St. Louis, great player. Uh, I remember coming into the parking lot and the guy taking, you know, parking the car says, oh, you're here to drop them off. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm actually on the team. So a lot of times I got, you know, looked like as a manager or some people thought, you know, what, what's he, is he a wrestler or a baseball player? And it's like, no, I am actually play basketball, you know, so – it was fun. I mean, I mean, there are fun stories on that part, but you know, by the time I was a senior, you gain that confidence. You just, you just go out, and I wish I would have had that more my freshman year. But it was a blessing. Did you take, did you take it all in, or was it a whirlwind? I mean, did it go by really fast, or do you have memories that you'll you'll sit and think about today, and it'll bring a chuckle to your face, or did it go by so fast that you know? you'd like to do it over again almost because it went by so fast. Oh, I'd love to do it all over again if my body would let me. Um, on, on that stage, I mean, it's, you know, it didn't go by fast when you lost a game and you played very poorly and you got off that plane and coach says, get taped up, we're meeting on the court in 30 minutes. And that was like one o'clock in the morning. Um, those were long days or three hour practices when they're just working, you're working, and you're like, man, this will never end. And, it, you know, those didn't go by quick. But now I would do anything to go back. And that's when I go and speak to kids, I, I explain to them, this is a one opportunity. And even I work with the men's basketball now with the, the academics part. And it's hard for me. I'll go down and just watch them and practice. And to me, you know, I keep, I, I, I'll say stuff to them. I rip them a little bit and say, hey, you know, you're not hustling. You do not want to look back and say, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. Instead of sitting there, sitting in your room, get out, work on your game, get your teammates together, spend time with them. I came from a small area. I mean, our high school is about 1,200, but I said my grade school outside was really small. But my best friend, roommate, was from East St. Louis. And we were teammates. And, and you know, I went down there and visited him. And, man, that's a – life change right there I was just shocked and you get to be around guys like that they're your family and when you spend time with everybody you really develop you know a strength in you to go out and want to teach kids you want to tell them hey this is the opportunity I show them my three big ten rings I don't even wear them I don't even wear them I had the memories my main memories of being with my coaches and my team and you know going and competing for Purdue that was the memories. And what's really the hardest memories are the games you lost. Because I felt like we let Coach Katie down and we let the fans down. And I still, that hurts me today. So I try to work with our guys. And that's the one thing, you know, being a pass player, coaching at Purdue, and now being their academic guy, it's, you know, God has its ways. But I can always talk to the guys and say, hey, what, what's your life goals? You know, you, God gave you ability, but at some point you're going to be done. You have another whole life ahead of you. So take advantage of it. Get good work ethic right now. Bust your tail. Because if, you know, you got 15,000 people in Mackey, there's a lot of job opportunities when you're done playing. That's like a job interview. So why not hustle? Those people are paid money for you to come watch you play. There's no reason to not give an effort. So it's – you try to give those lessons to our guys now and also to, uh, you know, high school kids and grade school kids that want to play the college game. I said, you know, God bless them. Set goals, but keep your academics right. Keep your, you know, the enthusiasm, your energy. Keep that all going in life and being respectful for your parents. Listen to them. What, what was – why the transition from coaching to the academic advisor? Tell us a little bit about your mindset or did, did you want to get out of coaching or did you just feel like this was a lot better for your family life and things else that were going on? Did you feel like you were still, you know, you're still a major contributor to the basketball pro program and then roll into, do you have a stern talk with uh, the basketball players when they first meet you on letting them know of, you know, all these things are going to be happening, but you need to focus on what you were just talking about just a second ago. 
Yeah, well, it was, you know, coach 10 years in college. And, I mean, it was, I mean, the life of a basketball coach in college is very difficult for a family, you know, atmosphere. Um, and, and I loved it. I loved the competition. Um, Scott Drew, when he took the Baylor job, he called me, wanted to take me down there with him. And at that year, I believe we didn't have a great season. I think we just made the NIT or we might not even made the NIT. And I just, you know, in the newspapers were hitting on Coach Katie or asking, oh, is he getting too old? And to me, I sat there and I thought, if I left to go to Baylor, even though I really kind of – I wanted to because Scott Drew's a good guy. I'm just not going to go to somebody I don't know. I really liked him. But in the same point, Coach Katie was like a father to me. He gave me the opportunity to come to Purdue. He believed in me. Gave me that opportunity. Then he gave me the opportunity to coach for him. I'm, not, I'm, going, I'm loyal. And I told Coach Drew, Scott Drew, that I said, I can't leave, I can't leave him. I'm going to stick with him and try it out. And, it, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't second-guess myself. He, he's, to me, is, is somebody that I kind of look up to and worship. And, and uh, he always says the things, and you listen to what he says, and they're important things about life. So I kind of stayed with him on that, and really we gutted out with Conzo Martin and Jay Price. And then when Coach Painter came in, I thought that was a great transition for uh, Morgan Burke to do. And Coach, you know, Painter and I were great friends. And so for the first couple of years, we were trying to get things going and rolling. And Coach Painter and I just sat down. And he goes, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about getting some guys coming in for coaching. And he goes, we might have this academic job. Would you be interested? And at first I was like, no, I don't want to. I, I want to stay in coaching. But then it's like, it's a blessing to still be involved with Purdue and not have to travel and kiss your family goodbye in the month of July and go and recruit. And it worked out for the best. I mean, it was. And, you know, when you have guys come in, recruits coming in, and you can say, hey, I played with the head coach. I played with, you know, Coach Brantley. And he – and Coach Painter brings in quality coaches. And you can see where they're at now. And it's, it's just been – you know, somebody, again, has been watching over me to be in this opportunity and be able to help the Purdue family and men's basketball and the tradition they got. And he keeps plugging away and keeps going. Coach Katie comes back. So it's just to be able to have the opportunity to be around them and represent your university, it's by far, to me, I can't, I can't ask for a better position. And it's, you know, and I get to watch my kids grow up and I'm there for them. I mean, I lost my mom when I was young for melanoma and I had the same, you know, light skin. So I got to watch myself and get checked and make sure. And you don't know how long you're going to be here. So you take every day and you take advantage of it and you work with your family. And I love it. And when these guys come in, I do the same way. I preach it. Hey, we're a family here. Once you're done, you leave. You're still family. You're always welcome back. And that's the one thing Purdue always has. It's a tight fit community. And when we talk stories, when the ex players come back, um, it's a blessing. And then when you get those guys, new guys come in, you almost have to de recruit them, meaning because they're told how great they are. And then they're, you know, they're out there with the coaches and working hard. And, and I'm kind of trying to support them, be the supportive for basketball. But also, I'm on them as far as academics, taking care of their stuff, making sure they have the right goals set. You know, like Coach Katie always says, every time you go to class, it's like putting, you know, money in the bank. you got to take care of it. So I kind of preach that issue to them. And I tell them, if I have to tutor them, if I have to read their paper and help them, uh, they don't want that. They don't want that. But I organize everything for them. But they, they are, they're a bunch of uh, kids that are just growing up for four years. You can see them mature while they're there. And... I enjoy it because when you're recruiting, you're telling them how great they are. I tell them that when they come on a recruit visit, I don't have to do that now. I'm going to tell you the facts, how it is, give you all the resources. We're going to stay on you. If I'm on you, it's the reason why, because I care about you. And you got to learn that. And you got to represent. I mean, you got to come in saying, what can I do for this team? What can I do for this university? Instead of sitting, coming in thinking, well, what do you have to offer? What can you, know, what can you bring me? to make me come here. I just think some kids have it opposite now because they're, they're shipped around and wanting so much. I just tell them the truth. You know, you got to work hard here and you're going to be successful in life. Uh, 
So I, I have a question. I do a lot of these shows just because I have questions I want answered. I don't care if anybody else enjoys them. But here's my question. Is Brantley a joker? Oh, yeah, we'll call him Big Cat. Yeah, Brandon's good. Um, you know, I give him a hard time because Coach Weber was always yelling at him about classes and his academics at times, and we used to make fun of B all the time about that. And I mean, he took care of his business. But we always – we were big joke jokers in college as a team. We had fun. We wrestled together. All of us would get together, wrestle. We'd have our – We'd just all get together, just the team, and have our own little gatherings in our apartments just for bringing, bringing guys together. And, you know, Brandon was one. He, he would joke around, um, but he was one that we always make fun of each other. He would take it, and then he would also distribute, you know. And, and that was fun. I mean, I, we'd tell jokes to each other. They would rip on me, you know, wearing my boots and jeans, and, <laughs> and I, I would get on them. And. You know, and I'd say, well, I'm going to wear so you can see my underwear today. But, I mean, it's just – these guys were, you know, once you can learn and you have that companionship with each other and joke with each other, it, it, it makes a team unite, I mean, together. And, like I said, with Brandon, he was – you know, he was always a jokester a little bit, but he was just funny to be with. He was a great teammate because he wanted to win when he got on that court. He went after it, and there's probably I don't know the only the only kind of guy I don't remember getting in a fight with because I got in a fight, you know, a little brawls with everybody on the team in practice at one point just because competitors. I would I would go at him, and Brandon would would go at it too, and and he you know everybody on the team, and that was what's nice about him. And then we get in the locker room, we joke about it, and and yeah, I would you say he's a joker. I would say definitely, but. He, he, he takes it well, too. Did you have a nickname, or did they give you a nickname, or how hard of a time did they get you for your hunting and all that kind of stuff? Um, the, well, they called me Bear Claw. Um, <laughs> Coach Kendrick started that. I don't know. Then it started turning into Claw or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I've been called a lot of things, so I, I, I'm used to it. But, um, but Bear Claw was probably what they always said, and um, – and to me, I think maybe could maybe I fouled a lot. I don't know. I was kind of that hockey player that comes in and doesn't know how to skate and just gets into fights with the other team's best player, I think. But that's where I would I would be on the bench. And if I see one of the other teams, you know, players doing something, you know, playing hard or doing something with one of our teammates that I thought was dirty, I'm going to come in and screen them. I'm not going to play dirty on them, but I'm going to go screen them and, and get into them. I'm going to protect my teammates. But then in practice, I'm going back at my teammates to make them better. And, that, and that's where I think that nickname came back because we used to get in a lot of fights in practice. And Coach one time had to go buy these huge boxing gloves. They're oversized boxing gloves because we would get into a fight. And then Coach with two guys would get into it. He made us put these gloves on and have everybody get in a circle. And then we had to hit each other. And you'd start punching each other. But it's so big and so soft, it was – it's worthless. And so then he just, you know, he knows one of the coach's ways to get in guys, get your frustration out. And he said, now let's go play, hug each other and let's play. And it was, I mean, that was a great job because there's many times we do competitive drills, guys knocking each other down. And the next thing you know, a fist is thrown. And then <laughs> two more guys were all going after each other. So it was, I mean, nowadays I look back at it and it's like, there was a reason why coach did that. And it was, it was a blessing. What has the virus or what current situation done to the college game of basketball? What do you think its effects are going to be? Uh, how has it affected uh, Purdue University Boilermaker basketball? Um, uh, you know, uh, what's going to happen in the future? Do you have a, 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 an input on that? Well, I mean, as far as the, like the recruiting and, and that part, I mean, I can't really – give say too much on that because I'm not involved with the recruiting and all that. And it has to be difficult for everybody. Um, but then the other ways is academically is what is important to me with our guys. I just don't want them to think, oh, this is an easy way out and, you know, start, you know, letting up on things and because everything is online and it's very hard to kind of, police it in a sense because before I'm always saying hey let's look up your grades let's see every week let's write out the assignments let's make sure that we got no duck eggs no zeros 
And my biggest thing is communicate and just tell me the truth. If you messed up, let us know what's corrected. Um, and it's been, it's been nice because our guys, we have a good group of guys and they'll tell you the truth. And that's that really number one, communicating on certain subjects. That's huge. But with the whole virus thing, we're kind of limbo and trying to see. I know our guys are getting tested. They're just back and they're getting tested and, and they should be able to start working out here this week. So that would be a blessing. And, and I hopefully it'll keep going because I think the one thing that they're missing out is the opportunity to be together because those were the best times before practice. After practice, you know, all those things, you're always hanging with the, your teammates. That, to me, is something you can't replace. And with this virus, it's, it's very sad because it is affects so many people. I mean, health-wise, and it affects people with their, uh, you know, for livelihood. And I'm focused on my guys and trying to make sure they're staying, you know, up to beat, knowing what's going on and being cautious and understanding that, hey, they could affect somebody else. But also, you you know, take care of your business at school and take care of your teammates. So I, I just, as far as the recruiting part, that's got to be a difficult challenge for everybody. It's hard to get kids to work out on their own. Um, and so we're just trying to do their best and on, on getting them back into the groove. You know, Coach Katie was your coach. He was a father figure. You love him. But share a couple of your favorite Gene Katie stories. Oh, a coach, he just, man, he would, oh, where do you start on those? He, coach was one of those guys that, I mean, everybody said, oh, he's mean. He looks, I mean, how can you play for a guy that's so mean? And he just has that growl on his face. But I always said, man, you didn't grow up with Fred Foster, my dad. I mean, my dad, to me, was 10 times harder than Coach Katie. And, you know, I learned right away growing up, we were belling, hey, and if you weren't stacking or you weren't keeping up and he's throwing the bells down to you, he would throw those bells right at your legs and take you out to teach you. And, and one time you don't – you do not put bad body language out because he'd go harder at you. And then when I got with Coach Katie, man, he was always on us and just getting on us. So it was, it was very uh, – you know, easy for me to be able to accept it. You know, when they get on you, I just felt like I'm letting him down. So I wanted to play harder. And it was it was fun because you, we had to get our teammates to play harder. The coach would sit there and, you know, be after a game, and he would just – if it was just one player that did something at the end that maybe lost it, he would rip everybody. And he would get on you and just say, you guys aren't playing for the right reasons. And – he'd just be jumping on you. So, I mean, as far as like the stories go, I mean, it, it was kind of funny in the sense where I'm trying to think of some ones that he would, you know, he was very respectful on, on, on players. And he always says, I will not embarrass you on the court if you don't embarrass me. He says, you listen, you hustle and do the right things. But there's, there's times, I mean, I'm trying to sit here, if you get all the players together and they start talking stories, um, he, he'll, he'll just rip you on things. But um, I'm trying to think of something that's unique. I'm trying to get off on this. Man, he would – ah, give me a second and think about that on that one. I'm trying to think. I saw one, but I said that one would probably be appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what's interesting i follow him on his page i've got to uh, meet him uh at a final four a very nice guy I, i'm really good friends with dave shellhouse and of course uh, uh, Co uh coach shellhouse was an all-american at purdue but um it's really interesting to see him gardening oh yeah he's yeah. getting into it i mean he's i mean he when he comes and visits and stays here he comes out and watches he goes to my kids games and I mean, he's a legend. I mean, he, but to me, I don't look at him like that. I just look at him as a father figure because he always has something good to say. He wants to see my hay equipment. He wants to, oh, we used to do it this way. And yeah, he, he just, you know, I don't see him with his temper at all. And he's, you know, he's relaxed more nowadays and it's great to see. Um, but he'll call me every other day, he wants to talk about something for like a couple minutes. And he goes, all right, love you. See ya. And he just, he's a blessing on it. I mean, that's, but we always give him a hard time. And he says he never did. But like when Glenn Robinson played, 
And that's the one thing with Coach Katie. When we were at, on the road in the hotel and that bus left at 5 o'clock for the game, that bus was pulling out at 445. Coach was on the bus usually 45 minutes before we left. And everybody knew you could be there at 445 in the last one getting on the bus. And he would sit there. You don't want to play. You want to get your ass kicked. You better be focused. And then you, you know, when people start leaving the hotel room, you hear the door shut. Man, we got out of our room quick and got on that bus. We did not want to be the last one getting on there because he would just get on you a little bit. He'd just say one little remark. But we always joke with him with Glenn. You know, once Glenn got on the bus, hey, we're ready to go. So we always made sure we beat Glenn on the bus because he goes, oh, no. But I know one time we had a situation in, in study hall. A couple guys got into an argument, and, and, and a fight broke out <laughs> in study hall. That's how competitive we were. And Coach heard about it and came in and, and just basically um, called it all the meeting and just ripped on everybody. And I'm like, I'm not even involved in this, and I'm getting yelled at. But then he turned around and, and just all of a sudden picked out Glenn and said, Glenn, do you want to go pro? Get your blank out of here and go pro. You're going to hurt our team if you're going to think you're number one and all that. And we're all like, man, don't say that. No, no, no. Don't. We want Glenn to stay. You know, but, I mean, that's what Coach did. He treated everybody, you know, equally. But we always give him a hard time saying, wait, once Glenn's on the bus or make sure Glenn's on the bus, we're going now. We're safe. We got everybody. But. Glenn was one guy that we always give coach a hard time because, yeah, how wouldn't you? You go to make sure he's on your bus when you go to the games. But he got on Glenn that night. And there's times in practice he got on him all the time. But Glenn was a competitor. He didn't, he didn't you know, he got mad and went harder. He was very fierce competitor. He was fun to play with. Todd, take us back. I know your mother passed away when you were 15. And you had uh, the opportunity to play basketball the same day, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. We, what, well, what was the mindset on that? Well, it was, you know, she was in a hospital. She went in. I remember coming home from practice. Um, I got dropped off, and my brother was at college. My sister, she was, uh, I believe they were in Houston playing. Doug was playing for the Rockets maybe at that time. Um, but it was one of those things where I was by myself. Dad just left the note, says, do chores. I had to take mom in to get checked. He came in that late that night and says, well, they're doing more testing. She never came home. So she was there. Um, it was in the early start of January. Um, and she passed away February 10th, but she never came back. But it seems like when she was in the hospital, she kept on going downhill. They kept on finding more things with this melanoma that spread and, um, and then we knew that she wasn't going to come out. And it was that one morning I was waiting for my ride to get to school and, and my ride wasn't coming. And I'm thinking I'm going to be late for school. And, and I was stressed and I was worried. I was trying to call my high school coach on the landline. I was trying to call whoever I could to get a ride. And then all of a sudden my sister came home and, and said, it, you know, she, mom passed away. And basically it kind of, you know, hit me and I just sat there and I was like, I wanted to go to school. I want to go to school. I don't want to think about this. And, but they said, no, you got to, we're going to stay together today. And then, well, no, I got to get going. We've got a game. So sure enough, we wound up, you know, we talked about it and I said, your call. And I said, I, I just want to represent my mom and my family. So it was hard, but I mean, you know, when you compete, you get your mindset on something. That's like a lot of times in academics, our guys are studying. We'll turn around and, and I said, hey, you might be able to study for 20, 30 minutes. You lose your focus. Go shoot free throws. Come back. Don't sit there and try to just drag it out and do poor work. Focus and then go shoot free throws. Get your mind off it. Go do something on the court. Dribble, do something, and then come back. You can get something out of it. And that's kind of my, my thought process. When things get going bad, you got to think of some positive and think about the blessings. And I kept on thinking, you know, at least I had 15 years to get to know her. Some people don't get that opportunity. And so I just try to find out the positive, you know, motives for me. 
Todd, we, we have ran long. I appreciate it. But uh, for someone who was told that you were too short and too slow, you have three Big Ten championship rings, an MVP, you've had a, uh, you've had, you've had a great life. I'm very blessed with, you know, my family. Um, for, you know, God has his ways. And the, this path I would have never dreamed of. But, you know, I always tell kids, you know, your, your number one fans are your parents. So when you're done playing, you better say I love you because it took me right when my dad was passing away when I told him that. And I tell kids, don't think you're too cool to say that. Tell your family you love them, your brothers, your sisters. Stay close, protect each other, help each other. In the same way with, you know, with Purdue University and everybody here, the friends that I have growing up and my friends here, I am very blessed and my family alone, just three kids and a beautiful wife. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful for everything.